thanks very much uh, for the invitation. Um, because it's a, it's a time to actually stop and think. And um, it helped me to stop and think. Because over the past year, um, with the series of events that have happened over the past year, and the rapidity with which they happen, it's really difficult to uh, stop and think about things. And uh, so being invited here helped me to, in fact, stop and think about things. Um, and what you're doing here, despite what Kelly says are tremendous pressures, you're here actually for a couple of days to stop and think about uh, who you are, what your relationship is to your union, to your members, to your group, and to the broader American society. And I think uh, that that's um, really important to do. And I know that one of the things that you've been doing since 1998, can you hear me back there? Is it my loud note? Since 1998 is to um, think about labor history. Uh, and you've done several things along that line. Back in 1998, you had a conference to create local labor historians. And you started collecting some of the materials and archives of your local. Uh, which up until the formation of the State Council were scattered and the collection of those archives and the material and those stories is really important. Then you helped a student of mine named Jennifer Phipps write her master's thesis on the firefighter union here in Washington State and the threat of privatization against the, your union and your work. And that was a really important um, thing to do. And then, you know, you did this strategic plan. I read your strategic plan in 2000. One of the things I read probably come up here. And it's really important to do your assessments. There's this guy named Sun Tzu. He wrote this book called The Art of War. It's a master book on strategy. And if you're going to have a strategic plan, you need to do your assessments. And the assessments are not only assessments of your own strengths and weaknesses, but the assessments of the strengths and weaknesses of your enemy. And the, so when you were doing that strategic plan, that's really important for you to do. And you spent time and energy to do that. And that's important. And then, you know, I'm a collector of uh, labor videos. When I was director of the Labor Center, I collected labor videos for seven years. And you guys did a labor video called Power Through Participation. Have you all seen that? You should see it. You should show it. That's one of the best labor videos I've seen. And you know why? Because you put your own union local history into the context of labor history, into the context of American history. And that labor history in American history is things that young people do not get. And they will not explain their position in American society unless they get that. So I would do your best to take that video and use it. It's uh, really important. And then I found out that you hired Ellie Ballou to write a history of your union. And the last one I was involved in was a history of the machinist union. Um, which we did on um, District Lot 751. Uh, that was the last time, and that was like 83 or 84. So here it is, your union, you, are using the information and the stuff that you've been developing on history to write that history, and to get that history, not only to your members, but I mean, you guys should take that book when it's published and get it in every school. Give it to teachers. You know, corporations give books free to public schools. You guys should make sure to get that history into the school so they can, some of those young kids can understand, you know, the importance of union because they're going to have a living. Um, so um, I appreciate that and all your work on that is very important. And you're, I think, although I've been out of the labor center for know, almost six years, I don't think there's another union writing their own history and going to put it into a book and get out to people. That's, that's important. I'm going to uh, do two talks. I've got until noon. Um, and I'm going to give two talks. One, I'm going to do about an hour talk on labor history, basically from the end of the Civil War to the 1960s. Then we can take a break or have questions and comments or whatever. And then I'm going to try and take us from the 1970s right up to the current time period. Um, okay. Um, and um, I want to start first by saying a few reasons why uh, labor history is important. Um, now, I don't know about what you learned when you went to the high school or college, but when I went to high school, there were only a few people that were acting in history. Uh, they were um, Rockefellers, 
Vanderbilts, Bullets, uh, here in the, the Northwest, Warehousers. Only those people were acting in history. And of course, I never saw myself, never saw my family, never saw my parents, never saw my dad. Um, so one of the reasons that you examine your own history is to see yourself acting in the world. That's one of the reasons you do it, right? When you're faced with a problem you can't imagine yourself acting, you go back and look what your grandparents did, and you'll find out that they acted. And they shaped the way your life is today and the way it's this American society. So one of the reasons you look at labor history is to see working people acting to define what American democracy is. That's one of the things you see. Um, another reason to look at labor history, or actually I think it's you know, American history, um, is because it is a storehouse. It's a storehouse of strategy and tactics. Strategy is what's your overall plan to accomplish your goal. Tactics are your method of enforcement. Labor history is full of strategy and tactics. Any problem that you're bumped up against right now, it's been dealt with before. Now, maybe the context is a little bit different, maybe the economy is shaped a little bit different, but we've dealt with it before. So one of the reasons you look at your own history is to see this as a storehouse of strategies and tactics. Another reason to look at labor history and American history is because you'll find out about where benefits come from, where your wages, where your pensions, where your you know insure, where those things come from, where your safety on the job comes from, where your hours come from. You'll find out because a lot of people, you know, we started working in the machinist union. A lot of the machinists in 1983 thought that their wages and benefits came from the Boeing company. A lot of the IWA people, the woodworkers, thought they got it from warehouse. And there might be some people here who think you get it from the fire department. I don't think you do. You get it from your union struggling for over 100 years. That's where you get those things. That's where your wages come from. So one of the reasons and benefits and safety and standards and preventive measures. So one of the reasons you look at labor history is to find out where your benefits come from. I think there's another reason, a couple more I'll get to. Um, one is, is that, you know, we're not just workers. We don't just exist in the economy. As much as a lot of people would like us to believe that we're just, you know, uh, exist in the economy, we exist in much more than we exist in society. And that society is made up of institutions. And those institutions are a part of our history. We created those things. And so you can't even explain, you know, the the society that you live in without reference to the labor movement and to American history. And I think the final reason that you look into history, or another reason you might want to, is because you see patterns, responses. And those patterns are things that you'll bump up against if you're looking into the future. What's going to happen in the future? Look at the past. Because what is history? History is the interaction between the present digging around in the past to figure out what to do in the future. That's what it is. It's a continuous interaction between the present problems, looking at how they dealt with in the past, and so that you can, in fact, shape your future. And one of the patterns that you see in this country is every time there was a war, there was a concentration of wealth at the top. There's a reorganization of governmental authority at the top, combined with economic concentration of wealth at the top and a resistance to those people that have some problem with that concentration of wealth. After World War I, World War II, Vietnam War, and currently, one of the things going on is that pattern, and it's important for us to see what that pattern is. So those are some of the reasons I think we should look at labor history, and um, what I'm going to do here for, uh, let's see, it's 9.30, I'll do it for 45 minutes, and then we can have comments and questions, and if you have, like, you know, questions that you go through, just you know, write them down, and or comments, or anything you want me to go more into, and I'll try and do this fairly rapidly. Uh, but what I'm going to do is, I'm going to talk about, in each one of these periods, I'm going to talk about the shape of the political economy first. Now, what's the political economy? What's that word mean? It simply means, what's the relationship between the state and the owners of capital? What's the relationship between the state government, in other words, right? and the way in which the economy is organized. That's political economy. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk about the shape of the political economy, right? and then I'm going to talk about how we responded to that shape as the labor movement, what our successes were, and then what the reaction was to those successes. And I'm going to try and do this basically from after the Civil War to the 1960s. And then we'll take a break, and then I'll try and bring this from the 1970s up to the present time. Okay? Now, if you're getting lost or you want me to slow down or whatever, just, you know, say so. Just all this chickens here. Okay, so the way I do it is, uh, and one of the things I think that's really important for uh, labor to do, for any organization to do, and when you're thinking about moving into the future, is answer these four questions. What is it that you want? Right? I mean, you know, take some time to think about that, doesn't it? What is it that you want? And then the next question, of course, is, which determines the whole shape of your strategy and tactics is, who do you want it for? Who's your audience? Who's your subject? Who's going to be the agency of your change, right? Then the next question is, what's your strategy? What are you going to do it with? And the final question, of course, is, what's your tactics? How are you going to enforce your strategy? You can use this to think your, about your assessments, about your strategy, and about how you're going to direct this union to build it and make it safe not only for your members, but make your mission safe for the rest of American society. Okay. So, first, the political economy. The political economy after the Civil War. So what was the Civil War fought about? The Civil War was a conflict about whether you're going to organize American political economy based upon human slavery or wage slavery. And those people that wanted to base it on wage slavery won. That was the industrial north. And what they did was they went after the one thing that the south had more than the north, and that was wealth. And that wealth consisted of four million humans who were in slavery at a combined assets of about four billion dollars. And so the political economy there was about an industrializing north that was beginning to build industry, right, as the new basis of the economy and move into agriculture, right? So the political economy was basically an industrializing one. It wasn't national yet, but they were beginning to build a national market. And the main engine of building that market was the railroad. The railroad was now the largest capital enterprise in American society. It dwarfed any corporate activity. The railroad coming to meet across the United States, right? And of course, once you have a railroad that connects the East Coast to the West Coast, what do you have? You have a national market. And once you have a national market, you can begin to build mass industrial enterprises to deal with that market. So that's kind of the shape of the industrial order. The difficulty, of course, is, is that from the 1870s on, right, 10 years or so after the Civil War, from the 1870s on, there was a mass depression. Unemployment falling, prices the rest. Okay. So a group of people, mainly tailors, yeah. met in a secret society in Philadelphia in 1869, and they created this organization called the Knights of Labor. And the Knights of Labor, basically believed that labor and capital could get along, that it was possible to bring society together. And what they wanted to create was a thing called a cooperative commonwealth. Right? That's what they wanted. They believed that you could in fact have a cooperative commonwealth. So I'm going to put here, I'm going to leave this for you guys. But they basically wanted to create a commonwealth. Now, it's interesting, you know, in the 19th century, 1800s, right, 19th century, there was a third largest bestseller was by this guy named Edward Bellamy. He wrote this book called Looking Backwards. You ever heard of that book? You should pick it up sometime. It was a really interesting read. And what that society was, was a cooperative society in which Americans basically produced and distributed goods and services 
through a cooperative society that was democratically controlled and in which both men and women and all members of society voted. So this is the idea about how do you get the wealth of society and produce it and distribute it through American, to the American people. So the next question was, who is it for? Who's this cooperative commonwealth? You heard the, com the word commonwealth, right? It's, it's, it was important in this state's history. Lots of some states are still called commonwealths. So who was that for? Now they had an interesting thing because, I won't be able to read this, but you can read it later. Producers. It's interesting, right, because they believe that every American, not everyone, but most Americans were in fact the ones that produced the wealth. They didn't think it was Bill Gates or George Weyerhaeuser. They thought Americans who worked were the ones that produced wealth. And there was a very broad definition of the producers of wealth. I think the only people that they didn't think produced wealth was lawyers, speculators, and bankers. But everybody else, everybody else was welcome to join the Knights of Labor, including employers, small-scale employers, right? So they believed that these producers of wealth were the ones that they were going to organize in those cooperative society. The next question is, what was their strategy? Their strategy was to create infrastructure for that cooperative society, right? Infrastructure, education, communication systems, rail systems, water systems, all those things are the infrastructure upon which this cooperative society would be built. And so what they needed to do was to take government, because government, now you're talking, not talking about federal government now, right? You're talking about local government, state government. So they're going to take, and if in fact, by the way, if in fact there wasn't a government entity that matched what they wanted to do, they created that entity. You know, one of the interesting things about this state is there's something like 4,000 special districts of government. Do you know why? Because you can't explain the fact that there's 4,000 special districts of government in this state, which is more than any other state, without reference to this idea about how you organize society, because it came out of this idea. If people had a particular problem they wanted, they created a little form of government that they would control and they'd do it. So they used government to build the infrastructure. So the question was, how in fact do you get control of government? Because they believed that government was neutral. In other words, that you could take it. It wasn't an instrument of the ruling class, right? You could take it. How do you take it? First of all, you had to create a place that wasn't a bar. I know a lot of people, I fell into it too, you think you could organize things in bars, but of course, you know, you don't. Uh, you get, you know, things like this. But uh, these people said, we have to find some way for working people to find a place they could come to that had a solidarity culture that didn't create alcoholism, right? Which is the way that, you know, well, I think they buy a song. It created drunks. So what they did was, they created assemblies. And assemblies were two-tiered things. The first tier was that cooperative society that produced and distributed goods and services. And the second tier was a place where a working person could come and get a drink of water that didn't make them sick. That's one of the reasons, of course, people went to the bar, right? There was no water to drink. So what they did was they created a two-tiered thing, one that showed the type of economy they wanted to build, and the second thing was the culture that was going to enforce that economy, right? Unless you have those two things, right? Unless you have a model for people to work toward that works, and a culture that enforces that, you won't be able to move. So they first created an assembly. The next thing they did was they extended the franchise. And of course, the Knights of Labor were people who believed if you were a producer of wealth, you could join. So that meant that after recently freed African Americans were a part of the Knights of Labor. Women became 10% 10, 10 of the Knights of Labor at its height. Their lead organizer was a woman organizer. And so they brought in lots of people to extend their franchise because they believed that they had the majority of people, the majority of people would vote for government. That government would create infrastructure for these producers of wealth and out would come a cooperative society. The final thing they needed was a party. And this became the People's Party or the Populist Party, which became a major party in the United States up until the 1896 election. By the way, again, you can't explain this state without 
the People's Party winning the elections in this state and creating the public education system that all your kids go to. Um, so, here it is. This is the way they were going to do it, right? Cooperative society produces the wealth, government creates the infrastructure, you take government by creating assemblies that have models and culture, extending the franchise, and creating a party to mobilize the vote. Okay. So what happened to the Knights of Labor? They became the largest organization of labor in the 1870s, probably 700,000 strong nationally. One of their first victories was against a guy named Jay Gould. Jay Gould was a builder of railroad systems. They went down toward Mexico in order to create the copper wealth for the Guggenheim family. Jay Gould was a guy who said he could hire one half the working class to kill the other. These guys organized against the Gould Railroad, struck it successfully, and got wages. As a result, people boomed into the Knights of Labor. And then, just like you guys, uh, I think you, when you first started working, you were a 24-hour continuous shift, right? And if you, could get, if you could run to get some food somewhere, you could get it sometime. If you didn't get back in time, you get fired. So one of the things they were trying to do um, was to lessen the workday. And so what they did was, they said, each craft union, beginning in 1884, 1885, 1886, each craft union would do a national strike. And then in May 1886, everybody would strike. And everybody in the nation would strike for the eight-hour day. And that's May Day. That's why everybody in the world, except us, of course, celebrate May Day. But May Day is about the struggle of the American worker for the eight-hour day. When I go to Mexico, the streets are called the Martyrs of Chicago because the cost of that was for four people to be hung in Chicago, Albert Parsons and the rest. And there's a million people that march in Mexico City to celebrate the American workers' fight for the eight-hour day. Isn't that interesting? I marched with them last year, this year. <coughs> okay, so what happens? Because of, well, actually, I want to mention a couple other things. So what are some of the successes here? Are you still with me? OK, so what are some of the successes here? There's an Article 9 in the state constitution of this state that says, it is the paramount duty of this state to provide for education for every resident of this state. That comes out of this. Why? Because the populists, the Knights of Labor, believe that education was absolutely fundamental to a democratic society. Every port in this state, including the one here, is owned by the public. It's the only place in the United States where that's what well, not only owned, it's the only place in the United States that's owned by a public entity with direct elections. Why is that? Because these people believed that they had to find some way to fight the railroads and control the produce going through the ports, and they created a port district in order to do it. This state's also a publicly owned electric system called PUDs. Do you know why? Because of this idea of the way you create a democratic society. And your union, your union, after 1889 fires in Seattle, Spokane, they decided to make firefighting a public responsibility. Why is that? It's because there was municipal ownership parties in Seattle and Tacoma that believed in this system of governance. And after those fires, they switched it so that they wouldn't have to go to Lake Coeur d'Alene to find the key to the guy that privately owned the water system while the town burned down. Right? So, you know, the fact that you have a publicly owned, controlled fire service comes out of this tradition. And you can't explain why it exists without it, and you'll lose it if you don't know it. So here's, you know, this, okay? Now, there was tremendous repression against uh, the Knights of Labor, and uh, they brought federal troops in to bust their strike the second time they struck against school. There was the repression after the May Day March in uh, May 1886. And a group of people decided that, in fact, they had to reorganize the way labor responded to the political economy, and that was called the AFL. And the AFL stands for the American Federation of Labor. It was started in 1886. Um, your union was one of the, you know, affiliated with the American Federation of Labor. Samuel Gompers gave your union, you know, a first charter. I think it was in 1906, 1907, if I'm not mistaken. 
Um, and so what did the AFL want? This is really important to a union like yours because one of the things they wanted was control of work. Now, were they talking about a wage? No. They were talking about who defines what work is? Who defines whether it's good or not? Who defines how it's used? Who defines how it's paid for? You know, the construction trades in San Francisco at the turn of the century controlled not only what work was, when it happened, but they were the ones that announced the wage increases. It wasn't the employers. The AFL was about the control of work. Its definition, not management, its definition of what work was, whether it was good or not, and how it was reimbursed. Who did they want it for? They wanted it for their craft or guild. And how were they going to get it? It's interesting, right? Were they going to get it with, with government? No. They said they weren't going to get it with government. They were going to get it with the employer. So the relationship of craft unions is oftentimes a relationship with the employer, right? And so the question became, how do you do that? And the first thing is, is that you have to create a, well, I mean, this thing is a part of a definition of American democracy too. Because they said, what is the fundamental basis of democracy? And they said, it is associations of working people who define their work and who define their role in society, not just at the workplace, but in the community. That's what a guild was. It wasn't just about, you know, negotiating for wages. It was about how you act in society, how you promote civic virtue, honesty, all those things, right? Um, and so the first thing they did was they created, you know, this thing called the Constitution. You know, when I was director of the Labor Center, uh, I stopped going through uh, contracts because when I started being the labor center director, oftentimes the employer didn't give a damn about the contract. They were rolling over those unions. So I went back and said, you know what we should do? We should start reading constitutions. Why? Because constitutions, not only are they tremendously radical documents, but they are broad-based documents talking about the goals of this group of people in American society itself. So, they set up a constitution which was a way of life enforced by bylaws, right? And then the next thing they did was they used this tool called a strike. It was not something the Knights of Labor liked. The Knights of Labor boycotted things because they had a lot of Irish people in there from the Irish Land League that knew what a boycott was because they used to do it in Ireland. They did political parties. They did voting. But they didn't strike. American Federation of Labor believed that you strike the employer if he won't, you know, come up with your definition of things up here. And the final thing they did was they wanted a written contract. Okay? So, and this, you know, American Federation of Labor is still very much a part of the labor movement today. Practically every, you know, many of the locals that were here were originally assemblies. And one of the things you learn when you look at labor history is you know, how these things merge and build upon each other. There's no reason, that's another reason to look at labor history, there's no reason to repeat it, you know, go back and look at what you did before and then build on it. These people built on this. Okay, so now I'm going to stop and go to the turn of the century. The turn of the century, what's the political economy at the turn of the century? It's changing, why? Because this industrial model, this mass industry, mass to a mass market, is now nationwide, right? Um, you've got all the small regional capital operations, right, were overcome by huge groupings called, like Rockefeller. Rockefeller now controlled 90% of the oil refining capacity in the nation. Carnegie and Steel merged 100 steel companies now, so it's national. You know, Carnegie used to work its workers 12 hours a day. No, 
Yeah, 12 hours a day, seven days a week for 20 cents, right? And then he sold that thing for a half a billion dollars at the turn of the century. Sometimes people say, you know, to me, like, well, isn't labor corrupt? I say, well, what about Carnegie? Is Carnegie, was that corrupt? Anyhow, there's this tremendous concentration of wealth. And the United States now starts moving overseas in the armed expansion overseas. They take apart the Spanish Empire, right? They take Puerto Rico, they take Cuba, they take the Philippines. We go over there with 68,000 troops to fight the Philippines. It's interesting, right? We're still fighting the Philippines. Mindanao, right? Still difficulty for the Western world. Nonetheless, we're, you know, starting to take armed invasions overseas. And we're starting to get Latin America, Argentine beef, right? Cuban sugar, fruits from Central America, right? So the American empire is now beginning to shape up. And one of the things that changes during this time period, right, is the definition of patriotism. It's when the flag, the salute, comes into the classrooms. And patriotism shifts in its definition. Because prior to this, patriotism was about a particular way of life, a small r Republican way of life in which people were independent producers and sustainers of their own life. And if you were independent producers and sustainers of your own life, then you could be politically free. And if you were politically free, then you could act in a civic way, to create civic virtue. That's what patriotism was, right? It was patriotism, that's what it was a patriotic person, a person who engaged in that form of life. And one of the things that was made during this time period, during this shift, was the idea, I reject, but nonetheless, the idea is, is that when America expands overseas, you must support it, and that's being patriotic. One of the things that happened here was a group of individuals said, you cannot use this model of separate craft unions to organize this new industry. They called it the American separation of labor. These people were saying that because you have these mass industries now, right, beginning with automobile, right, automobile started to happen, general assembly lines are starting to happen, that you had to organize people wall to wall based upon everyone inside the plant. It was called industrial organizing. And the people that promoted it were a group of people who met in Chicago in 1905 called the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWA. Now, what did they think American society should be? They said, look, American society is now an industrial society. And in order for it to be a democratic society, you had to democratize the industry from the bottom up. And once the workers controlled the industry, they federated across the top, and that's society. It's called syndicalism. Um, and it's a model of how you organize society in various countries. Anyhow, they got an idea from the French and from the Spanish. Um, and so what they wanted was industrial democracy. And the question was, who did they want it for? They said anybody that works for a wage. Now that's a very inclusive definition, right? Anybody that works for a wage. If you define it, if anybody works for wages, there's going to be somebody bringing in your organization, you're going to have a lot of work, right? You're going to have a very large organization. And these people built a very large organization. So they said anybody that works for a wage, that make any difference what their gender is, what their color is, what their national origin is, whether they're a citizen or not, if they're here in the United States working for a wage, we organize them. The question was, who do they do it with? Did they do it with government? Do they do it with the employer? You know, they had this thing when I first started reading labor history. There was always this thing that I always wondered, what the hell is that thing? Because, you know, the Wobblies were always marching toward the horizon, you know, in their literature. And one of the things they were always marching for was the OBU. And I kept wondering, what the hell is the OBU? And the OBU, of course, is one big union. Uh, because they believed that you don't want to have a separation of labor 
you want to have everybody in the same union, same organization, building toward that industrial democracy. And then the question was how they're going to get it. I don't know whether you guys know this, you probably know this. Most workers know this. It was one of the first things I was taught when I worked at the labor in Wenatchee, Washington. And um, I can't remember this guy's name. His name was Jim Sanford, you know. Jim Sanford was this huge man who, like, you know, really didn't get going until about 1 p.m. in the afternoon, you know. But after that, you couldn't stay with him, you know. But um, when the boss came, you know, Jim, when I first got on the job, Jim said, you know, when the boss comes, I want you to stand in your shovel. I said, what? He said, yeah, when the boss comes, I want you to stand in your shovel. So when that boss came over the ditch, you know, old Jim put his foot on the shovel and started talking to the boss, you know. Put my foot on the shovel and started talking to the boss. Because it was, we're the ones that determine when and the rate at which we work. The Wildies were people that believed in, you know, a lot of people thought that they were, you know, saboteurs or something. Um, and they had this definition of sabotage, perhaps. And what sabotage was, was a technical withdrawal of worker efficiency. It simply means that the worker decides not to employ his mind anymore. And, you know, if you guys don't employ your mind anymore, you know how screwed up things can get. So it's, there's various things it's called. It's called working to rule, working to rule, slow down, whatever. But in the construction trades, oftentimes I speak to construction trades guys, you know, they all knew what wobble the job meant. But they didn't know where wobble the job came from. But wobble the job was from the wobblies. That's what the industrial workers of the world were called. They were called the wobblies. And so they first, you know, they first talked about wobble the job. And then the second thing was the general strike. Um, the Wobblies were an amazing success story in lots of ways. Um, they organized the textile workers in, in the East, silk workers. Uh, they organized the port workers in New Orleans. They actually signed a collective bargaining agreement with the governor of North Dakota for farm workers, I believe that, 1918, 1919. Um, in 1917, they pulled 50,000 people out of the woods in the Pacific Northwest. You know, we think now, you know, like postal workers or something pulled out 50,000 people, maybe 100,000, that's a big deal. These guys in 1917 pulled out 50,000 workers and shut down the industry in 1917, 50,000. They were extraordinary organizers. Uh, they were people who taught workers to have a sense of somebody. I like Martin Luther King said. Personal self-respect. What's personal self-respect? Personal self-respect means that you have a voice and you can exercise it. That's one of the things I really love about coming back to like some union meetings. Because there you have people stand up on the floor and argue and stuff. I mean, geez, where do you see that anymore? You know, people have a voice and they exercise it. They imagine, right? Not only they have a voice, but they can speak to who they are, their relationship to the group and the rest of society. The Wobblies had tremendous political self-respect. Amazing tacticians that the labor movement still uses today, amazing tacticians about how to get position on capital, because of course if you don't get petition, petition, position on capital, they will run over you. Okay, so what happened here? Um, the U.S. moved in basically into World War I. Uh, in 1917, a few months after election, President Wilson engages in World War I. And the United States begins to issue new laws and activities to slow down people who were dissenting on World War I. <coughs> Eugene Debs, who was the head of the railroad workers, simply said that World War I is, the master, is, a, is a war between the master class fought by the uh, Employees, basically. He got 10 years for that. Um, they passed the Alien and Sedition Laws in 1917 and 1918. That meant if you made an abusive statement toward the American government, you got 10 years in jail. An abusive statement toward the American government, you got 10 years in jail. Um, 
President Wilson hired this guy as Attorney General. His name was A. Mitchell Palmer. A. Mitchell Palmer began a reign of terror against the Wobblies, against immigrants. He raided in 1919, 1920, he raided and brought 6,000 immigrants and tried to deport them from the United States because he believed that they were aliens, subversives, and against the war. So one of the things that happened here was a tremendous series of repressive actions against the victories that the AFL and the IWA were doing now. What was the main problem? The main problem was is that after World War I, the American corporations came back and they said, we want an open shop. You know what an open shop is? No unions. It was called the American Plan. It's called the American Plan. When it was, it was a plan to get rid of all the unions in the United States. And there was tremendous resistance to that on the part of labor. Right? And the very first resistance to that in February of 1919 was the Seattle General Strike. How many people here know about the Seattle General Strike? The Seattle General, you know what a General Strike is? A General Strike is the withdrawal of labor from economic activity, right? The general withdrawal of labor. That's stage one. What's stage two? Stage two is the temporary replacement of leadership. The Seattle General Strike was the only general strike in U.S. history that went to stage two. Stage three, of course, is the permanent replacement of leadership, and that's a revolution. But in Seattle, in 1919, for five days, the General Strike Committee controlled the city. They fed everybody, produced, you know, they, just, they made all the economic and political decisions, and as someone said, nothing moved but the tide without the, without the approval of the General Strike Committee. So the General Strike Committee ruled that city, and that put out, right, that, that strike in February, sent a shockwave through the United States. And you're talking about millions of workers out on strike saying, no, we, your unions too, right? Your unions were meeting during this time saying, all we want to do is affiliate with the International Federal, with the, excuse me, International Association of Firefighters, right, in D.C. That's what we want to do is affiliate with them. And your unions, you know, Everett, Tacoma, Spokane, went back to the convention during this time period, 1916, 1917, and when they came back, they were all fired. Okay, so you had this wave of strikes. Went from Seattle, went to the coal miners, and then it went to Boston. Boston police strike, right? Now, what was that? It's a bunch of people like me, mixed, you know, Irish, who simply, who simply wanted to rec have the ability to recognize their union. And what did Calvin Coolidge do? Fire him. He brought in the troops. State troops, federal troops, right? President Wilson at the time said this is an attack on civilization. Plus, they're all reds anyhow. They're all Bolsheviks. Right? Now, these are working people simply asking for recognition of their union and affiliation with the AFL literally. Okay. But during this time period, it was called the Red Scare. And during this time period, right, with the acts. Alien Sedition Acts, the Palmer Raids, the Raids Against the Wadleys, there was this tremendous attack on labor, and labor fell. The AFL, which during the war period had grown to five million workers, now go down to two and a half million workers. The Wadleys are pretty much jailed, exiled, or killed, as they would happen in Centralia in Washington here in November 1919. Shot out. Hung. Okay, so what happens now with the political economy? How am I doing, by the way? Oh, good. So what happens with the political economy? Right? Warren Harding's, President Warren Harding comes in after the war. What's he do? He brings in chief executive officers worth about $600 million to be his cabinet. One of them is this guy named Andrew Mellon, the second or third most wealthy person in the United States at the time. Mellon Steel, later oil in Texas, right? What's he do? He says, well, the way to get this economy going is to cut all the taxes to the rich and put them on the poor. Right? And so one of the things that happens is, is that there is this industrial boom that goes on. There's now retail credit. It's called the Roaring Twenties. Retail credit for the first time. P 
people jump into debt on installment credit, buying things they shouldn't buy. The economy gets in more capacity, right? And pretty soon, there's no way to buy all this stuff. And what happens? The economy falls, and it's called the Great Depression. That's a worldwide depression. During that time, there was a group of people that said, well, shit, you know, we better organize something new. And so what they did was they created this committee called the Committee of Industrial Organizations in 1934. It was called the CIO. That's where the CIO comes from, right? It was called the Committee of Industrial Organizations. And what did they do? They said, hey, these wobblies were right. We have to organize wall to wall these new industries. And what were the industries? The industries now were auto. Okay, so what did they want? I think what they wanted was a thing called social justice in the midst of this worldwide depression in which, you know, 15 million more people were out of work within six months of the fall of the stock market, right? A third of the people were unemployed. Farming prices just, you know, fell. People couldn't eat. Bank deposits, right? Nine million bank deposits. Just like what happened in Argentina recently, man. Sorry, it ain't there. You don't have it. Plus your money is worth shit anyhow. Excuse me. So, social justice. So who did they want it for? They wanted it for two people. They wanted it for the industrial workers, not craft, but the industrial workers. They were called unskilled. Can you imagine somebody working on an assembly line? They call them unskilled. Industrial workers and the poor. So again, they had a very broad audience. And how were they going to do it? They were going to do it with the federal government. Now the federal government is huge. It's not the state government anymore. And also industrial corporations. So what were they going to do with the federal government? They were going to create a floor below which no American citizen should have to fall. And they did that by doing two things. They, passed, they got the Wagner Act passed and the Social Security Act passed, both in 1995. What did the Wagner Act do? The Wagner Act gave private sector people the right to organize unions. Now, they do that just because, you know, they thought it was nice to have a union. No, they did it because it was American workers' way out of the Depression. Sometimes people think it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, this guy, rich guy from New York that got that. It wasn't. American workers were the ones to decide how to get out of the Depression. How do you get out of the Depression? You stop beating us up in this industrial warfare. You give us the right to organize and talk to these employers about the things we need. Wages, benefits, and conditions. And if you do that, you're not going to have warfare anymore. And people have money, and they'll buy the stuff that you're producing. They also said that there's these people here, oftentimes they can't work, they're disabled, they're old. Those people have a right to exist in this society, and we're going to create a thing called the Social Security Act, that allows American people, whether disabled, old, infirm, blind, right, to be able to still live even though they're not working. And that was called the Social Security Act of 1935, right? It's called the Social Welfare Floor. Okay, now how did they get this thing? You know, when the railroad workers struck in 1877, right, it was the first nationwide strike in the United States, railroad workers. So, um, they wanted to get the attention of the owners because the owners had gotten together about four of them and said, we're going to like lower wages all at once, which they did. And so the workers said, uh, well, we'll stop the trains. Now, you know, will you guys talk to us? And the employers said, no, we're not going to talk to you. Um, so then they um, soaked down all the rails to make sure no trains moved. And they said, you going to talk to us? And they said, no. Okay, well, we're going to take all the stuff off the trains and distribute it to all the people in our communities. Is he going to talk to us now? And they said, no. Okay, well, we're going to drive the trains into these roundhouses and burn them to the ground. And are you going to talk to us now? They said, no. And they brought the federal troops in, and they busted the strike. So the question for 50 years was, how do you get position on this thing called corporate capital, which was something the American people never imagined? was a part of their definition of American society. These government by like, private interests is what they called them. And in 19, winter of 1936 and 1937, there were a group of workers called the United Auto Workers of America, about 170 of them. And what they said they wanted was a 30-hour week, six-hour day, time and a half, the right to control the speed of work, 
and the recognition of the union called the United Auto Workers. Pretty good, huh? 1936. And what they said was, we're going to not burn down your corporations, not burn down your plants, but we're going to take them over and sit down in them. And it was called the sit-down strikes. And they got position on capital. Now, of course, the way they got position on capital was not just sitting down, but making sure everybody in the community supported that sit-down, right? Just like these teachers in this party. And they went out and talked to the community first before they started. So, right? And that sit-down strike got position on capital for the first time, and it was a boom. Sit-down strike swelled. And out came this thing called the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which organized all the industrial workers in the United States. Okay. Now, I'm going to go on about 15 more minutes. Can you run away? Do you want to take a break? We'll keep going? Okay. So, what happened again to all these things? World War, World War II comes along. And the United States engages in World War II. Right? And then after the war, the question became, who benefits from the fact that the American workers, along with the Russians, of course, 20 million died, you know, breaking the back of, of uh, Hitler's army in Russia. We lost about a half a million men and women. They lost 20 million breaking uh, Nazi Germany and fascist Germany. Uh, nonetheless, there's 18 million people, American workers, came back and said they want a few things. Uh, they want peace. Uh, they want unions. They want to begin all the social reforms that were going on in the 1930s before the war happened. What were those things? 30 hour weeks, six hour days, the right of unions to take their wages from profits of the capital, uh, the right to plan about investment in technology. The right to sit as equals with the American government in business and planning who gets to benefit as a result of World War II. And you had the largest strike wave in American history in 1946. Millions and millions of workers struck for those demands. Millions. Um, what happened as a result of that? Um, there was governmental repression. Uh, it was called the McCarthy era from 1945 to 1955. Um, what was passed? Mm. Uh, first there was the Taft-Hartley Bill. People know what the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 was? It was called the Slave Labor Act by American Labor at the time. It took away your right to secondary boycotts. It took away your right to mass picketing. It took away your political voice because if they, you didn't sign up and say that you were not a Communist Party member, then you could not be a union member. It, it silenced the whole notion American labor had a right to have a political voice being like, why do you union? I mean, for me, I join a union because I don't want anybody messing with my right to have a political voice, to mess around with my ability to work. I still want something to say. That's why I joined the union. That's why I joined the Federation of State Employees. I don't want anybody to mess with my right to speech. Okay. So they passed the Taft-Hartley Act against labor. They passed the uh, Truman's loyalty oaths. It's interesting, right? The loyalty oaths set up loyalty boards that interviewed and investigated every federal employee in the government. They set up loyalty boards in every department. They could use information from every different source to begin to characterize particular people without your knowing what the characterization was. They set up this thing called the Attorney General's List. If, you, if your organization was on the attorney general's list, you couldn't get any federal money, you couldn't get any veterans benefits, you couldn't get any of that stuff. And you were immediately identified as subversive. <coughs> who were on those? Well, people who wanted peace with the Soviet Union, people who wanted to organize the South because it was still a racist South. They wanted to break that racist hold on American labor in the South. So there was a tremendous period of repression, and American labor suffered as a result of it. But in 1955, they came together, the AFL, American Federation of Labor, and the Congress of Industrial Organizations came together and formed an organization in 1955 called the AFL-CIO. That's where that came from, right, 1955. Now, what did the AFL-CIO want? This gets kind of controversial, but nonetheless. 
I think it's accurate. What they wanted was the maintenance of the deal after World War II. And the deal was this, in my mind. The deal was this. We government corporations will recognize your unions. If you try and organize our corporations, we won't mess with you that much. Um, so we recognize that unions are a part of the definition of American society. When you guys come to the bargaining table, we're going to give you ever increasing wages and benefits. Right? Now we're not going to give you the 100% wage increase you want, but we're going to give you some. But it's going to go up. So we'll recognize your unions, we'll give you an ever increasing wages and benefits in exchange for that. We don't want you to ask any more questions about taking your wages for profits. That's really important, right? Why? Because if you take your wages and then corporations are allowed or governments allowed to raise prices or costs, then that separates you from everybody that didn't get it, right? Just think of the difficulty of solidarity building across working people if, in fact, every time some union gets a wage increase, the corporation raises prices to three-quarters of the rest of the American people. So what the American labor movement wanted, right, was wages out of profits with price stability. But one of the things that happened was, no, you can't say that anymore. Um, we're going to take it out of prices. The other thing was, is that uh, we don't want you to have a political voice anymore. In other words, your own voice, we want you to participate in one of the two parties, the Democrat or Republican, set up PACs, do voter registration drives and the rest, but you can't have your own political party. If you have your own political party, like the Progressive Party in 1948, we'll call you a communist, subversive, and the rest. The other thing, of course, is, is that we want your support for our activities overseas. We want you to send your sons and daughters to the wars if we go to war. Now, was that a good deal? One-third of the American workforce got the American century, right? One-third of the American workforce got ever-increasing wages and benefits. They got to buy houses. They got to have suburbia. They bought two cars. They sent their kids to school. They became middle class. So one-third of that was a pretty good deal. They were all primarily white males, right? Women, after the war, even though they came in tremendously into the war period, they went back out in tremendous wage and categorical discrimination. The American labor movement was going to organize the South after World War II. They stopped them. It's called Operation Dixie. They stopped it. They didn't organize the South. So what they did was they made a deal with the existing corporations. Oh, excuse me. Oh, they, they basically did the membership, right? They were going to, who their base was, was their membership. Just their members. Unions became members, not leaders of a social order, but in fact, just about members. And they did it with corporations. And how did they do it? They demobilized their membership, and they turned unions into banks of experts. So what did you get if you went to a union? You got collective bargaining expertise. When I first worked with the Machinist Union, you know, it was incredible. Those guys, you know, the contract used to be about that big, and then it got to be almost a paperback about that big. Those guys, those business agents, they knew that contract backwards and forwards. It was incredible. But did they know the Boeing Corporation and whether or not it was going to China? No, they didn't. Because they had become focused on the expertise about collective bargaining for their members and became very narrow and exclusive. And from 1955 on, the percentage of the American workforce that belonged to a union declined. The high rate there was maybe 35, 36%. What's it now? Huh? Somebody said seven? Did you say seven? Is it 17? Is it that much? No, it was, it was uh, I think uh, the private workforce when I was giving these talks five years ago was like 11%. Um, of the workforce. Now that's probably the lowest, because it's called union density, right? The percentage of workers in a union, union density, is probably the lowest union density ratio in the industrial western world. Okay, so one more time and then we'll take a break. So what happens here in the 1960s, right? By the way, during this time period here, the CIO time period, that's when you start organizing your state council, right? There's this huge burst of labor movement, and you organized your state council in 1939. Is that right? Okay. 
So now you move into the public arena. Why? Because just like in our American Constitution, there were a lot of people left out of the deal. Right? First of all, the Wagner Act was only about private sector and only about private sector employees that were, that were engaged in interstate commerce. So that left out your entire public sector. It left out all your agricultural workers. Um, so uh, all of those people were left out. And so what this public sector wanted was recognition. And they wanted recognition just like the private sector workers had here. They wanted to have the right to collective bargaining. They wanted to have the right to move, right? To define themselves, to be recognized. It's a hard thing to do, right? So who were they trying to get recognized? Public workers. But also remember, this is the 1960s, right? This thing, this thing called the Accord, is starting to fall apart. People don't really know exactly what's going on. But there was this very tumultuous time called the 1960s, right? Massive urban riots in the 1965-67. Uh, the civil rights movement from the 50s and 60s. The beginning of the anti-war movement. Women's liberation movement. All these movements were starting to like say, this doesn't include us. We want some new forms of organization to get included. And so it was also about disenfranchised. So again, you know, American labor starts opening up again. Say, no, come on in. So the question is, how'd they do it? And of course, you know that in a lot of states, it's against the lot of strike. Or there's no language about it one way or the other. And so a lot of things, what they did was, they, they oh, excuse me, what would they do with what was their strategy? Their strategy was with two things, civil rights movement and the women's liberation movement. Now, why was it with the civil rights movement? Where's Martin Luther King shot in 1968 in Memphis? What was he doing in Memphis? Sanitation workers strike. He was starting to move beyond civil actions right to economic actions. He was starting to question the war in Vietnam. He was starting to say, this economy needs to provide for us too, right? And so he went down there to support the sanitation workers strike. That sanitation workers strike was supported by AFSCME with all kinds of funds, and that built AFSCME, American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, to be the largest public sector union in the United States. They joined the civil rights movement, right? They built upon it. And they built upon the women's liberation movement. Why? Because the women's, women's work, their wage and categorical discrimination was endemic into American industry, into the service sector. I mean, I think maybe they bumped 10 cents in terms of their percentage of the amount of money paid in relationship to a man, right? Over a 100-year period. And so they came out strong wanting the same thing. So one of the biggest unions, right, of women in the United States is the National Education Association. Right? Two plus million members, I think. Okay, so what they did it with was extra legal strikes. Extra legal. That means, you know, not illegal. It's not legal. It's extra legal. Uh, no one's saying anything about it. There's no law about it. Uh, the other thing they did was which, you know, I used to point out to people, um, if you want to organize, you have to put money into it. You know, I used to, like, say, when I first started the Labor Center, there was all these people saying, oh, we have to organize people again. Okay, so show me your budget. So I'd see this budget, right? And here were all this, you know, all this money for business agents, contract negotiations, all this other stuff, hotels, conferences. And then, uh, well, here's two slots over here in the organizational chart. What are these? Organizers. Uh, and they're unfilled. So you have to put money into it if you're in fact going to organize. And of course, the thing, one of the things you organize is a voice broader than yours, and that's the way you do that is with alliances, building community alliances. And one of the interesting things, which doesn't happen, but one of the interesting things here that I wanted to mention to you was that Ask Me in public sector unions used to put out information about tax systems. They used to put out proposals for just taxation. So the American people aren't faced with the only thing of voting against these very aggressive taxes. They could, in fact, vote for tax systems that would help redistribute the wealth, which is in practically the constitution of every American labor union. It's about distribution of wealth. Um, and they used to put out information about that. 
Okay, so Tom, would you help me? I'll finish it off with this, you guys, and then we'll take a break. Um, okay, so I'll finish it with this. You can see all the lessons that you can pull, right, from the way we've organized over the past hundred years. Um, and of course, this is just, you know, a sketch. I mean, this history is so rich and incredible. Um, but I need the other one here. But one of the things that I noticed when I started reading labor history was that there was this uh, conflict. Um, and the conflict was between um, values. Um, and I came to believe that American labor um, were in the midst of a value fight with the owners of capital. I call it market values versus community values. Um, but um, these are the things that uh, we're taught oftentimes that make society go. What's the best way to get things done? Compete against each other. Right? Even some, I remember some of the woodworkers, you know, thinking about, yeah, that's a good idea. I can run up the hill fashion this old man is 35 years old. I can outcompete him. He started running against those old guys that been, you know, and their own union members. Now, American labor, I think, has been about cooperation, about the values of cooperation and working together. And I think that sometimes we're caught in between these two in terms of what's the best way to organize a society. Because a lot of American constitutional founders said, well, you know, um, the way to organize society is have people compete against each other because they're all full of these vices. They love to compete against each other. And when they compete against each other, then out of the competition would come public virtue. Okay. Anyhow, I think that one of the values here is between competition and cooperation as the way of organizing society. The other thing is, what is it that motivates people? This is an interesting one, you know, because we're constantly told the only thing that motivates the American people is greed. Come on, you know, just greed. That's all you want, right? Whenever a union's on strike, oh, I'm just greedy union people. Um, and uh, I don't believe that. I believe that people are motivated by an inquisitive nature. They're interested most and will fight the hardest when they're interested in figuring out what is it that's going on in my life? What, how, in fact, can I deal with what's going on in my life and move forward? I want to find out about that stuff. I need to stop and think about that stuff. And when people stop and think about that stuff, that's when, in fact, they'll go to war. They'll fight. They'll strike. They'll win. They'll struggle. They'll build alliances. Uh, they won't do it for a wage. What's the best way to organize society? Accumulate. Right? What are you supposed to do in society? I mean, you're supposed to get to it. Load up that garage. Load up the house. Load up your kids. Load up your debt. You're supposed to accumulate stuff. Why? You know, can, are you, that's what makes you a good person, right? Because you get all this stuff. That's what American workers believe in World War II, right? We're not going to let you control your work environment. We're not going to let you do these things, but in fact, you go out after work. Don't say shit for those eight hours, but afterward, you can go out and buy that car, buy that boat, buy that whatever it is, right? Okay, I don't believe that either because I think the genius of American labor is about how to distribute things to more and more people within American society. In fact, in every constitution of American labor says we are going to organize the wealth of this country and distribute it to all the people, including our members. And I think the genius of American labor is the ways in which the community ways in which they have, in fact, distributed the goods, services, and benefits to American working people. How do you control things? What's the best type of organization? Hierarchy. By the way, you know, if in fact you want to control a fixed asset, hierarchy is a pretty good way to do it. You know, I mean, hierarchy became the form of business organization when you had these huge mass plants. Bureaucracy became important because you had to figure out how to control this mass plant, right? Hierarchy, hierarchical structures. Um, but in fact, if in fact you approach your enemy who is organized hierarchically in the same way, they'll crush you. And American labor has always done it differently. They've spread out, they move horizontally, right? They move across, they learn across. 
And when they approach the enemy, they approach with a broad base. It's called horizontal web organizing. They've always done it. What's the best type of leadership? Authoritarian. What's the labor movement believe? Collaborative leadership. You move around, right? You train lots of people. You organize on two levels, formally and informally. You have a variety of structures so they can't see you when you approach them. So instead of authoritarian leadership, you have collaborative leadership. And the final thing is, what's the purpose of society? In this model, Margaret, the purpose of society is to exclude people. Is to exclude people from those that have accumulated. And in American labor and American history, I think, our genius is, in fact, how we include people. How we build models, organizations, communities, unions that, in fact, include people. Include people that have different skin color, different gender, different languages, different cultures. That's what makes American labor strong. And I think that when American labor follows these values within this framework, they expand. When they follow these values, they contract the moves. So that's my first talk.